This heinous story, which took place in England, has over the years become one of the country's most famous criminal cases. A young woman was murdered while walking in the park with her two-year-old son. The only witness was her child, and the police couldn't find the culprit for 16 years. When the case was solved, the police were accused of catastrophic unprofessionalism. It turned out that they had made a huge number of mistakes that had cost several lives. In this video, we will tell you how one murder story grew into something bigger over 16 years and how it all ended. Rachel Jane Nichol was born on November 23, 1968 in a village near Colchester, England. She grew up in a decent, full family. Her father was an army officer and her mother a housewife. From an early age, the young woman took part in various volunteer programs, helping the elderly and children with disabilities. At age 11, she enrolled at Colchester High School for Girls, where she was active in dance, singing, and acting. All of her teachers insisted that the young woman had real talent and should develop in that direction. However, Rachel herself was more deeply into the study of history and English. After school, she got a job as a lifeguard at the pool in Richmond. Rachel later planned to try her hand at hosting a television program for children. In 1988, when she was 20 years old, Rachel met her future husband, Andre. The couple began dating, and a year later, they had a son, Alex. Together, they moved to an area of London called Belham. By then, she had already been offered a job as a model, but she decided to devote her full attention to her family for a few years and then try to get a job in television. On a summer morning, July 15, 1992, Rachel took her son and their Labrador for a walk in the local park. At the time, Alex was only a month away from his third birthday. This park in Wimbledon Common neighborhood was popular with the locals. There were always a lot of people there during the daytime, mostly parents with children and dog walkers. Despite this, because of the large area and the abundance of greenery, it was always possible to get away from prying eyes and enjoy nature in solitude. Unfortunately, there was a downside to this. At about 10.30 a.m., a woman walking in the park noticed a gruesome scene. A young woman was lying on the ground. There was a lot of blood around and a small child was sitting next to her. The victim was Rachel. Several dozen police officers arrived on the scene. They had to cordon off an area of four square kilometers where there were hundreds of potential witnesses and possibly the killer. Detectives soon realized that none of the park's visitors had seen either the moment of the attack or the killer himself. No one except for one witness, Rachel's son, Alex. They were to get all the information from the two-year-old boy. Of course, this was extremely difficult to do. The child was first admitted to the hospital for examination to make sure he was not injured. Later, the detectives did get some information from him. He said he and his mother were approached by a tall, thin, white man with brown hair. Everyone in that park was questioned. It took the police almost an entire day, but it only took a few hours for reporters to get the whole country to hear about this gruesome crime. Rachel's case instantly caused a wide resonance, which is not surprising. A young mother died in front of her child in one of the most popular parks in London. Residents of Britain were even more shocked when the newspapers leaked information from the pathologist's report. Rachel had been stabbed 49 times with a sharp object. There was enormous pressure on the Metropolitan Police. Society demanded that the sadist be caught and punished as quickly as possible. And detectives did indeed have to work at an accelerated pace. In the first few weeks, they interviewed 548 men, 32 of whom were even arrested for a short period of time, but all to no avail. The police simply had no leads. The only thing the experts were able to find was a tiny piece of organic material that they thought might be connected to the killer, but 1992 technology simply didn't allow them to study it. By September, investigators were left with no suspects, so they enlisted the help of Paul Britton, a renowned profiler, to compile a description of the killer. Here's what he came up with. He is a man in his late 20s to early 30s, 
most likely living alone. All of his hobbies are also socially unrelated. He's interested in knives and the occult and has sadistic fantasies. In addition, he lives near the park. At the request of the police department, this profile, along with the sketch, was shown on television. After that, they received at least four calls, all with the same matching name, Colin Francis Stagg. In addition to the fact that he fit the sketch, the police ran his name and realized that he had already been on their radar. The fact is that Stagg had tried to enter the park the day Rachel was killed. Colin Stagg, 27, had led a secluded lifestyle. He had lost his job and was struggling to find money to pay for housing and food. He had a dog that he walked every morning in Wimbledon Common Park. According to his testimony, on the day Rachel was killed, he went there with his dog, but because of a severe headache, he quickly went home and went to bed. Toward evening, he felt better and decided to take his dog out for a walk again. However, on this approach to the park, he was stopped by the police. Stake calmly answered all questions and gave his details. The police had no evidence against Stagg, but he seemed to them to be a suitable candidate for the role of the killer. In addition, the press kept pressuring law enforcement agencies and they needed a breakthrough in the case urgently. That same day, Stagg was brought to the police station where he was held for three days. When questioned, he denied any involvement in the murder, but the detectives were beginning to believe more and more the opposite. First, occult books were found in his home, which coincided with the profiler's suggestion. Second, the police were able to find two women who gave some disturbing details about Stagg. One woman accused him of exposing himself in front of her in that very park. In his defense, Collins said he was just sunbathing in a secluded part of the park and the woman came there herself. Another woman reported that she had been exchanging intimate letters with him for some time. In one of them, he confessed to her that he dreamed of having sexual intercourse outdoors. All this was already enough for the police to consider Colin a pervert and finally believe his involvement in the murder of Rachel, except they knew that all these circumstantial arguments would not stand a chance in court. For this reason, the man had to be released. On the advice of his lawyer, he agreed to pay a fine for exposing himself to a woman in the park, though he continued to insist on his innocence. Detectives, along with a profiler, came up with a very unusual plan that was supposed to help force a confession. A Metropolitan Police officer, under the pseudonym Lisey James, began writing Colin letters of intimate content. She said she knew the woman Stake had corresponded with before. Despite the ridiculousness of the situation, the plan worked. Colin responded to all the letters and each time their dialogues became more and more explicit and perverted. Lizzie played the part of a woman with violent and sadist hobbies, sometimes even illegal, and their communication lasted five months. All this time, Stagg insisted that they finally meet in person, and the detectives decided it might actually help to get a confession out. The location and date was set at a park. Lizzie didn't go there alone, but Stagg didn't know that. Plain clothes officers were keeping an eye on them in case the man decided to attack their colleague. During the conversation, Lizzie, on the provider's advice, shared with Colin a fictional story about her secret hobbies. She revealed that her ex-boyfriend was into the occult and that they performed a ritual sacrifice on a living person together. Stagg took this information rather calmly. At least he kept in touch with Lizzie and they spent a few more hours together and parted ways. After that, they met a few more times and finally, the police decided to move on to the final part. Walking in the park, Lizzie talked to Colin about Rachel's murder. She told him that she wished he had been the murderer because she was aroused by thoughts of the crime, but it didn't work. Stagg apologized to her and told her that he had nothing to do with the murder. Lizzie tried to get him to confess several more times, but he kept denying his involvement. It looked as if the police had botched a six-month operation. They couldn't get any evidence that Stagg had killed Rachel, but the detectives were still convinced they were right. That's why they did arrest him in August 1993. At the interrogation, Colin was told all the cards and that all this time he had been in correspondence with a police officer. 
He was read excerpts from these letters describing various perversions and was also introduced to the real Lizzie herself. Stagg was shocked, but on the advice of his lawyer, refused to answer police questions. Investigators had hoped to the last that under such pressure, he would confess to the murder, but he did not. All they had to do now was to take the case to trial. All this dragged on for a year, which Stagg spent in custody. When the case finally went to trial, his lawyers blew the prosecution's arguments to smithereens. Even the judge was forced to admit that the whole operation with Lizzie James was overkill and that the police had behaved in an extremely unprofessional manner. In September 1994, Colin was acquitted of all charges and released. Lizzie James later resigned from the police, citing serious psychological trauma from the operation. The police, who had spent more than three million pounds on this investigation, were deadlocked. They had not a single suspect, and most of the detectives continued to think that Stagg was the murderer, and they were not alone in this opinion. The newspapers and the public continued to blame him for what happened. Every time he went out on the street, he caught the embittered looks of passerby. Almost the entire country believed that the murderer had gotten away with it, and this only added to the hatred towards Stagg. This went on for years. The Rachel Nichol case was finally hung in the balance, and the police made little effort to look for new suspects. Why, when they were all sure of Colin's involvement? By then, Rachel's husband, along with Alex, had gone to live in Europe for several reasons. First, he was constantly harassed by journalists, which reminded his son of his mother's murder. Secondly, the father felt it was not safe for his son to remain in London. He was the only person who saw the murderer. For a long time, no one knew which country they had moved to. Later, journalists did get wind that they lived in Spain and France. In 2000, Scotland Yard took up the case and assigned a new team to it. They studied all the collected material and witness statements, but they failed to find a new suspect. Only three years later, they announced that they had found DNA from an unknown man on Rachel's clothes. Analysis technology had only just matured to such a capability, and in 1992, such a discovery was simply impossible. Even in 2003, this tiny sample, which took experts 18 months to find, was not enough to establish identity. The data from that sample was only enough to rule out unsuitable people. And a year later, in 2004, the police finally had a new suspect. His DNA was already in the database, and a comparison with a sample from Rachel's clothes showed mixed results. That man was the 38-year-old Robert Knapper, a convicted murderer and serial rapist who, at the time, had already spent 10 years in a halfway house. His biography is striking in two ways, the cruelty of his crimes and the ease with which he evaded justice. Later, because of this, the police would face a wave of outrage from the public. Knapper first came into the hands of law enforcement in 1986. He was then given a suspended sentence for assault with an air gun. In 1989, he broke into a young mother's house and abused her. For the next four years, there was a series of similar attacks, but the police did not tie them together and could not reach the suspect. What followed was something truly amazing. Knapper confessed to his mother that he had carried out all these attacks. She called the police and told them everything. And what do you think? They found no connection between the crimes and the woman's story, so they didn't look into Napper's involvement. The only thing the mother could do was convince her son to see a psychiatrist. When Napper came back from there, he said that the specialist thought he was crazy, but took no further action. A short time later, he assaulted and abused a woman and her child in Crystal Palace Park. This happened just weeks before Rachel's murder, but again, the police failed to see the connection. This was by no means the only such attack in Crystal Palace Park, and police at some point figured out that one man was committing the crimes. From the words of witnesses, they compiled a sketch of him. After the publication in the newspapers, several of Napper's neighbors contacted the detectives they all pointed to the man, and the police called Napper for a blood sample. He simply ignored the request, and the detectives did not go looking for him. They simply forgot about him. 
In November 1993, London was rocked by another high-profile crime, which, as it later turned out, was also committed by Napper. A young mother, Samantha Bissett, was attacked in her room. In addition, the perpetrator did not spare her young daughter. What he did to them shocked even experienced detectives. The police photographer who arrived on the scene could not return to work for several months because of the shock of what he saw. Remarkably, the same profiler who had been brought in to investigate Rachel's murder, worked on all of these cases, and he believed that all of these attacks had nothing to do with each other. The detectives also saw no possible connection to the Rachel case because they were 100% sure that Colin Stagg was guilty. The team of investigators handling the attack at Crystal Palace Park also saw no connection. Napper was nearly 190 centimeters tall, and based on witness testimony, the perpetrator was shorter, but the maniac made one mistake in the attack on Samantha Bassett. He left a fingerprint in her apartment that allowed his identity to be run through the database. Napper had previously been fingerprinted after he stalked a woman in the street. He was not arrested until May 1994. When questioned, he denied guilt and was extremely calm. In his apartment, they found maps of London on which the locations of the attacks and murders were circled including the place where Rachel was murdered. They also found several notes on how to properly abuse women. Shortly before that, police found a knife in the very park where Rachel was murdered. The fingerprints on the handle matched Napper's, but even that wasn't enough to make detectives consider him for the killer because they were still convinced Colin Stagg was guilty. Napper, however, was still considered a suspect in Rachel's murder for a while but those charges were quickly dropped. The thing is that Napper said he was at work that day. In 1995, Napper went on trial for the murder of Samantha and her daughter. The prosecution struck a deal with him in which he pleaded guilty to manslaughter and the court sent him to a closed psychiatric hospital instead of prison. The fact was that Napper had been diagnosed with a number of disorders, including Asperger syndrome and schizophrenia. Because of this, the maniac could have avoided prison anyway, with or without a confession. As a result, the judge sent him to Broadmoor Psychiatric Hospital for treatment, with no time limit. Later, detectives wanted to question him about Rachel's murder, but the doctors forbade it. They feared it might aggravate Napper's mental status. Back to 2004, the new team of detectives on the Rachel Nichol case finally began to take a closer look at Napper as a suspect. After they compared his DNA to a small sample found on the young woman's body, the results were very mixed. That sample wasn't enough to confirm the similarity. It was only enough to rule out other suspects. In Napper's case, the results did not do with a 100% certainty. Investigators kept digging further using new technology. On Rachel's clothing, they managed to spot a microscopic piece of paint. Experts examined it and concluded that it matched the paint on Napper's iron toolbox. Prior to his arrest, he worked as a storekeeper for the Department of Defense. It is not entirely clear how he could have gotten a job there with his set of mental disorders. But the fact remains, he combined assault and murder with his day job. It took Scotland Yard three years to prepare this case for trial, and in 2007, Napper was charged with the murder of Rachel Nichol. During the first hearing, he pleaded not guilty, which prolonged the trial for almost a year. In the end, Napper agreed the same deal he had been, offered 12 years earlier, a change of plea to manslaughter in exchange for a confession. On December 18, 2008, 16 years after the murder, he finally confessed. For Napper himself, the verdict did not change anything, he was left in the same hospital under heavy guard. Most likely, he will never be released, but the news made a lot of noise all over Britain. The police suffered the most, fixating on Colin Stagg and completely ignoring on Colin Stagg and other serious leads. Instead, the investigation was divided into three separate lines. Each team of detectives looked for different criminals, while behind all the attacks and murders was Napper. 
That same year, 2008, Stagg sued the police department for £706,000, a record for Britain for unwarranted criminal prosecutions. The Metropolitan Police also issued a public apology to him. He subsequently wrote several books about his life experiences. In them, he described what it was like to be accused of murder. Stagg admitted that for 10 years, his life was effectively ruined by journalists and the police. After the whole of Britain finally believed in his innocence, he decided to spend all the compensation on travel, expensive cars, and other things that brought him joy. In 2010, a special commission issued a report criticizing the actions of homicide detectives. This document was called a catalog of wrong decisions and mistakes. And the reason for this is not only the fact that the murder could not be solved for 16 years. The whole point is that if the police had done their job properly, they could have arrested Napper before he killed Rachel, Samantha, and her daughter. No disciplinary action followed, however. All of the detectives involved in the case retired and one of the lead investigators passed away. As for Rachel's son, Alex, he did not give his first interview until 2017, 25 years after the incident. He said that growing up without his mother had been problematic, but that he had found the strength to let go and move on. Shortly before the interview, he went to the very place where his mother was murdered, and in that moment, he was able to finally let go of the heavy weight of the past. One can only hope that this story, like others like it, will serve as a lesson for law enforcement agencies around the world. It is too late to speculate about whether or not the police could have saved Rachel and Samantha, but it is never too late to draw conclusions and prevent future crimes. Take care and thank you for watching.